So, I am in China to ask me to repeat exactly. I'm now involved in uh, one of the NRCHHT's research initiative has a very long name called the Vaccine and the Emerging Infection, uh, Emerging Infection Readiness Innovation Research Initiative. But nevertheless, basically, we try to do something on the vaccine and uh, on the emerging infections, because uh, you both know that's a quite important area. And so uh, what is actually, um, to be honest, I really don't know how to prepare the presentation. And uh, so I was decided just uh, rather than showing you uh, lots of data, uh, which to impress you how many work are done, but I will just uh, split the, my presentation into two parts. One is I give you a little general background about the mucosa vaccine or mucosa immunization. And then I will give you one of the examples uh, we did the last few years as an international <coughs> collaboration project with and the Taiwan's Minister of Science and Technology and the National Health Research Institute in Taiwan. And so I don't know whether you actually heard about the mucosa immunization or the mucosa vaccine. And so one of the questions is why the mucosa adjuvants or the mucosa immunization and so far the stuff sticks with the needle quickly into our arm seems working and perfectly fine. And so there's a number of reasons to do that. One is actually uh, most of the infectious disease actually use the mucosa side as a part of entry. And for example, and the common flu at the moment, I probably got to slightly get a bit. And then all the gastrointestinal infection and the uh, food bond uh, related infection. I go slow the gastrointestinal one. And then not to mention the, uh, lots of the sexual transmitted disease. I uh, usually start with the mucosa effect. And also, so there is a number of autoimmune diseases such as asthma and the inflammatory bowel disease, and those are all mucosa-oriented uh, disease, or the disease uh, mainly, primarily uh, expressed in the mucosa. So that actually is one of the reasons you know, we need actually target the uh, mucosa side. So therefore, actually, we can focus uh, on the, uh, where the enemy got into it. And then the mucosal roots of immunization also has a number of advantages from the practical and the vaccine regulatory side. And particularly, the oral vac vaccine or the oral immunization is much more easy to administrate. And particularly, I think the baby will be much more happier. And in an in, in, in endemic area, and where large population needed to be uh, immunized and actually no training the staff needed. We can simply just give the vaccine to every individual, so let them swallow themselves or let them spray the uh, nasal <coughs> cavity. And so that is the other uh, thing. And another thing is actually and uh, normally all the injected vaccine, we call it a systematic immunization and actually generally fail to induce the mucosal immune response. So if you want to be a vaccine effective to the mucosa pathogen, actually the best way is induce the vaccine uh, at the side of infection. Where on the other side, the mucosa immunization can induce both and the uh, mucosa as well as a systematic immune response. And so the reason actually the, the mucosa immunized, uh, mucosa lots immune response can be induced is because on the mucosa system, 
like our respiratory system, our gut, and uh, our genital system. There is a structure called the follicle-associated epithelium. epithelium. Among there, there is a cells, sh short called M cells, and some called it microfold cells, some called it microvillous cells. So those cells, just like uh, uh, some other antigen presenting cells, which you more commonly hear, such as dendritic cells, they actually can uptake and processing the antigens and then presenting to the immune system and therefore induce and uh, then antigen specific uh, immune response. And so therefore, uh, those cells actually is a target uh, for many researchers try to, how to get access to them and how to uh, maximize their uh, function so we can induce uh, effective mucosal immune response. So other reason actually the mucosal immunization is attractive is there is a common mucosal immune system. So in the other words, actually in the body, regardless which mucosa roots you give the vaccine, actually they can induce multiple sides of the immune response. Also, whether you're giving orally or intranasally or intravaginally, actually they will induce primary the immune response at the side they start, but they also induce immune response on the other side. So that's the other advantage. In other words, if you have a <coughs> flu, you do not necessarily have to intranasal immunize, and you can auto immunize them. So that's the uh, other in advantages. And so because of its potential, and over the years, and the people have used a number of different approach and try to in in develop the mucosa vaccine or de develop the system to deliver the va vaccine into the mucosa side. So most of the traditional one is a life attenuated vaccine. And those one actually uses the mucosa pathogen, but attenuated them or inactivated them so they will not cause a disease. And those one are generally because they are almost like a nature and uh, way to get into the mucosa system. So they generally are quite actually a bit more successful and also easy to develop. Such, some of the things such as the adenovirus-based vaccine delivery and the BCG uh, vaccine for the <clears throat> vector for the, tulare, uh, for the tuberculosis and the salmonella um, attenuate the vaccine or the vaccine vectors. And however, use those life attenuate ones, usually there are certain advantage, particularly is their side effect, because those are whole cell, whole cell bacteria cells, and the value include containing a lot of toxic uh, components. And then others try to use some of the protective vehicles, such as uh, different lipsomes and uh, other and uh, particles, so they embed the antigen inside and then use the particle system to deliver the, <coughs> uh, the antigen vaccine antigen into the system. And the other most commonly used one is actually use some of the bacteria products, particularly uh, in the last uh, and decade, it is known some of the hosts can recognize special type of different bacteria and products through a system called toll-like receptors. And so there is a number of toll-like receptors, more than 10 different toll-like receptors, depending on which bacteria product or whether it's a virus, they will go through the specific uh, those receptors to activate the uh, immune <coughs> system. At one stage, actually transgenic plants and uh, another fancy name called edible vaccine was get very popular, at least experimentally. And uh, so therefore, has, uh, they, you go back a number of years ago, and they actually has a banana, and so people can eat a banana, which have all the vaccine components there. And so that is actually also uh, is a common way. And the last but not least, there are a number of other approaches people now using, and such as the DNA 
vaccine and the vaccine, a virus-like particle, uh, which actually I think Amin and other NRC research has been working the, um, before. And some more complicated, uh, like the ISCOM, which is a very complicated lepsome based with a lot of immunostimulator things. And uh, in recent years, also the nanoparticle, and particularly like a nano and cathetin particles and actually has been widely studied to as a potential mucosa vaccine and deliver system. And those systems all has, as I mentioned, basically is try to target the M cells and target the antigen presenting cells. And how, however, so far there is a very few mucosa vaccine actually being uh, licensed for the general public use. And one of the reasons is there still has a number of challenges to develop a, a mucosa vaccine, and particularly for oral mucosa vaccine. And the first one is actually immunologically, and because uh, most of our system to, has actually was evolutionarily to be a very, very tolerant to a lot of protein antigen. Otherwise, imagine if we respond to protein antigen very rigorously, then we probably will be stuck in the uh, washing room for most of the time because we're eating exposure lots of protein each day. So our system actually is pretty uh, tolerated. So therefore, you need a special way to overcome, to overcome those tolerance. And the second is uh, uh, like in GI system, the gastrointestinal system, there are lots of uh, enzymes and uh, things which actually can chewing off the antigen, the protein, very rapidly. So therefore, you have to protect those antigen, or you have to give lots and lots of antigen, be able to make the useful amount really reach the uh, immune uh, system. And the third is actually, although I said the mucosa system has a specific M cells, but the total number of the M cells compared with the other mucosa epithelial cells, their number is still very, very small, the percentage wise. And also they usually been covered by like in the gut, lots of gut contents, mucus in the lung, mucus and the things. So therefore, if we, for the vaccine to penetrate those one also is a challenge. And so therefore, as such, as I mentioned, there is really very few uh, mucosa vaccine there. I think that traditionally, uh, the oral and polio tablets probably is one of the most successful one, but that is a still a life attenuated vaccine. It's not a really a pure protein, we call the subunit uh, vaccine. And so actually, one of the world leading experts from the Novartis in 2000 was predict uh, the 2000 pile, actually half of our vaccine is from very, very traditional method to generate it. And, uh, and there is less than half of them of actually are really subunit vaccine. But he predicted by year 2020, that is next year, actually that traditional pie will be significantly reduced. And instead, a lot of new innovative vaccine will be uh, licensed and being used. Among them is a small pie of the mucosa vaccine. And, but unfortunately, like most of the things, and uh, I think except the stock market go down, usually the prediction is uh, not uh, very accurate. So I think we are still quite a bit away from achieve the, uh, this 2020 uh, vision. And so there is still lots of work. If you're working on the bioengineer, there is still lots of uh, space gaps you can contribute to it and 
to reach that. But nevertheless, there are some good news. So this, I think, the next two slides was not a very update. The, the, the web was pulled from my sl slides deck. So like this in 2012, actually, a HIV-based mucosal vaccine was showing some promise. But as you know, there is no HIV vaccine yet. So that's given again the moving to the fork. But the nevertheless, actually in the UK in the same year, actually for any children or young people less than, I think, 16 years old, actually they can take an uh, intranasal nasal spray mucosa flu vaccine. And so that case, they don't have to uh, do an injection. Apparently, this girl is very happy about that. And compare with this poor boy, actually, he's not too enjoyed with uh, this injection. So NRC, actually, over the years, also has some active work in trying to develop a mucosal adjuvant of the vaccine and deliver system. And so we have a number of the MVAD is actually it's a lipid based, more like try to protect the antigen and within. And the CDI GMP actually is an immunological stimulating molecule, although this one does not go through the TLR system. And later on, find that actually this one is one of the analog of the sting molecule, which is play a very important role on the DNA synthesized value and viral infection pathways. And then we have also a number of um, <coughs> bacteria um, vector delivery systems. And also the pentabody is a bispecific antibody. One side can be linked to the antigen. The other side can be linked, uh, targeted to the host, like M cells. So the idea is one system fit everything, so you all just need to change it and change all them almost like a wrench. You only need to change the sock size. They will fit um, everything. And, but because of the NRC's mandate, actually most of the work we only um, stop that before the IND because after that we usually will um, transfer the technology to the industry or uh, things because it's not and our mandate. And so that I was, uh, hope give you some background on the uh, mucosa vaccine and uh, um, the mucosa immunization. And so next I will give you a bit of uh, um, information or some of the real data is actually the last few years uh, our efforts to try to de develop a universal and um, mucosal pneumococcal vaccine. And so the universal we use here uh, scientifically probably is not very accurate. And uh, I think um, I never believed that many people agree that there will be a universal vaccine. You heard the universal flu influenza vaccine probably more often. And, but it is a word much easier to say. So really I think it's a broad spectrum uh, vaccine where against the multi, multi broad spectrum of the pathogen probably is a more proper word. So here I'm using universal just to make uh, talking quick. So I presume, I, I'm sure more, uh, most of you know uh, what the pneumococcal infection is. And so this actually is caused by uh, a bacteria called the streptococcus pneumonia. And the common name may be actually some dog called, just called strips. And I uh, think so actually, I uh, think most of us uh, during our lifetime, particularly when we're young or later on when we get old, uh, we actually meet this uh, infection. And the bacteria actually is in probably most of us and uh, the upper respiratory tract system. So that actually is a Good, they are not always cause disease. 
Um, but the bed is actually, you don't need to get it from other people. And so you wear a face mask, as you see in lots of Asian cities, doesn't necessarily help you to uh, prevent you get the disease because you have them in your own system. And uh, nevertheless, the bacteria does can split by like most of like flu. Uh, slow the coughing, slow the exposure of the respiratory secretion and things. And so this, this, this bacteria, actually one thing is uh, their surface is covered by a polysaccharide capsules. And that capsule is one of the variance factor. And but this bacteria actually have lots, lots, tons of different capsules. And at the moment, at least there is 94 different type of capsules. So, so far, the actually develop the vaccine. You have to, if your vaccine is against one type of capsule, they were not working against another type of the capsule. So, and as I mentioned, actually, the infection to the pneumococcus actually is everybody is at risk to get infected. However, child less than five years and uh, are usually the major population get uh, affected. So in those children, they usually will get uh, pneumococcal meningitis and all they will get inf invasive infection. That means the bacteria not only stay in the and respiratory system also split into the blood and cause the bacteremia. And all and mild form is actually cause uh, kids has the otitis medium. And so that is not a lisa, but it's very, very uncomfortable. So other population is like me, is actually just get into the age. And so the aged population is not only uh, susceptible to pneumococcus, but actually it's a major cause of the real issue with the flu infection. So we all know the 1914 Spanish uh, flu actually killed lots of people and because of the Spanish flu. But actually, if you look at the, in detail, actually lots of people was not killed by the flu virus itself actually was killed by the secondary bacterial infection. So that's why actually when you get old, when you get a flu, you're more likely not to make it because it is a secondary bacterial pneumonia. Pneumonia really kill uh, those people. And the streptococcus is one of the major secondary infection. The other one is a staphylococcus uh, is the other one. And so as I already mentioned, actually it is a quite a big issue. Uh, there is a 1.5 million um, people killed in each year in the world by this bacteria. And also is a majority of those is the kids in the developing countries. And so the left side of that map is Canada. So Canada as a well-developed country, we have a very good health um, care system. So it's not really a major issue. It's a couple of thousand cases uh, each year, most probably associated with, uh, with the flu, uh, flu in season. But nevertheless, this uh, bacteria has been listed as a short-term and high-priority pathogen by the Canadian government on the vaccine action plan. And on the other side of the map, you maybe not everybody can guess where it is, and actually it's Taiwan. And the reason time I have this map, this data, is because uh, we are in a collaboration. And so Taiwan has a slightly high incidence uh, than uh, Canada, but the Taiwan is also is good. But on the other side, as I mentioned, the infection can have four different uh, main and uh, main disease type. So from the, there is a larger population can be infected children with a, a otitis medium, but they have a, uh, there is not a really much mortality. On the other side, if you actually, the bacteria get the invasive disease, bacteria split, 
actually one in five people will die from the infection. And so that is actually um, quite bad. And similarly, the meningitis, that also is very uh, lethal. So actually, that's actually how uh, a lot of young kids actually uh, you know, after the infection, initially just a coughing and something, but then uh, later on, it gets uh, serious. And so the disease, because of the importance, so there is a vaccine available, and most of uh, us probably already been vaccinated. And so currently in the market, they probably have four or five different vaccines, and uh, they, they market by several different companies. And, uh, and they, but nevertheless, they all use a similar approach, which is they induce immune response against the bacteria surface, the polysaccharide captures. And so therefore, actually, um, those vaccines itself, if you get, pick the right serotype, actually they are very efficient. Actually, it's highly efficient, that's why, you know, Canada, we don't get many those infections. However, recently, actually, there is found a number of things. One is actually there is not lots of uh, uncovered serotypes. So that at the moment, the licensed vaccine, the highest one probably is 21 variant, means we cover 21 out of 94 serotypes. And, but there are more and more a uh, new serotype become important. So therefore, you need to uh, add more and add more. And the second is actually there is a zero replacement. In what is say like a, uh, there is some very nice data by UK um, public health. So in the UK, actually the vaccine the string get less and less and the, instead replaced by number of new strain serotypes. So like uh, here, actually, those serotypes, you probably can't really read uh, the thing, but those serotypes are not included in current vaccine strain. And then actually, gradually, they get more and more uh, common in the clinical isolates or associated um, with the infection. So therefore, and this is a major cha challenge. And economically, the those called the conjugate vaccine because they had to link one of the polysaccharides with, uh, with some protein to make the vaccine. They are very expensive. And any additional variant actually costs quite more. So the more variant, more cost. And so in the third world, particularly in the African countries, many children actually will not be able to afford to take in those vaccines. And this, <clears throat> so with all this reason, and so we decide actually, uh, yeah, actually that was one of the opinion piece from the um, <clears throat> clinic infection disease in 2015, really caused they actually we do really need to have a vaccine which will be provide broad spectrum um, protection. So with this in mind, so a couple of years ago, at an international collaboration project, so we just decided to look into actually the possibility to develop a protein-based vaccine. And the protein-based vaccine, which will be not serotype and related, but arguably because the polysaccharide is on the bacteria surface, so probably is a much better target to target them, where the protein even has some they are coming in between, so it's much more difficult to capture and capture them. So that was as a thing. So with this, we selected the three antigens, and the one called the PSAA, one called the PSPA, and another one called the PSC. And those antigens have all been and tried in the past as a potential uh, pneumococcal vaccine antigen, but neither of them has been really used in the uh, clinic trial moving to the clinic. And uh, so with this, actually, uh, we also use our collaborators' uh, technology, which basically be able to liquidate the 
uh, bacterial antigen polypeptides to try to increase their immunogenicities. And so we therefore we made this uh, vaccine and including the, those antigen, and then uh, we put into uh, the mice as you always is the first uh, place to go. And so we immunize uh, those mice and uh, intranasally for three times. And then on the five weeks time, uh, we start to uh, take a look at their blood to see whether actually they induce any immune response. And if they do induce immune response after a few more weeks, and then we will challenge those mice with different strains, some are from clinic, to see actually how they will do. So, the, so this is actually is the, uh, the, three, the top is the three antigen uh, we use, and with the PSA, the antigen has been lipidated uh, in this end. And then we also made uh, just, uh, just non-lipidated PSA as a, as a control. And so my collaborator in Taiwan actually uh, demonstrated that those protein are properly uh, expressed and they purified and on the <coughs> right side of the uh, panel with the proper size and the characterized. So when we immunize the mice and then we collect the um, their samples, and we, we did some ELASA to see um, actually whether the any antibody response has been uh, induced in the blood. And we also look at whether actually there is other antibody being induced in feces and in the respiratory tract. And we, for the um, experiment purpose also has no real relevance. We also look at the vaginal wash because uh, that don't, you don't have to kill mice. It's almost like a free product and the thing. And so as you can see, and actually the slightly colorful um, bar on the left side is our vaccine candidate. And the blue one is actually is a control positive control vaccine and then you don't see too much except the standard um, deviation bar is the shame immunized mice. So as you can see actually, uh, the, our vaccine does induce actually a very good immune response in both the serum and the IgG1, which is, uh, if you heard, uh, called the TH1, TH2 immune response. Actually, IgG1 is a more TH2 immune response by it and the IgG2A is more Th1 uh, immune response, which means more cell-mediated immune response. And we also find in the serum there is IgA response, which is a mucosal uh, uh, response. And we also demonstrate that it is also in the feces. And what I have not presented here, just for simplicity, actually we also see the similar immune response in the uh, lavage, in the respiratory wash, and also in the vaginal wash. Uh, so that's showing actually our vaccine does induce very good immune response. And but subsequently, uh, we was very surprised to find, actually, perhaps because of the lipidation, we found actually the adjuvants, the mucosal adjuvants, is not needed. You actually, we can just given the, given the recombinant protein, which is sufficiently good enough uh, to induce the immune response. And also, uh, since if you are reading lots of uh, immunology literature, you probably heard the TH17, which was very fashioned in number of years ago and believe that actually is particularly involved in some host defense against respiratory infection. So we also look at the TH17 and the TH1 immune response and the vaccine can also induce the, and those, <coughs> those response. The other thing we found that the, the serum from those vaccine actually can enhance a phenomenon called the optionization 
and support simply actually they can help the host like macrophages, neutrophils, those are effect cells to kill the bacteria. So with those in the presence of the serum from those immunized mice, actually they can increase the uptake, uptake and the eventual killing of the bacteria. So those basically showing actually the vaccine is showing some uh, induce some good immune response. And, but nevertheless, whether it's work or not, we have to see whether they protect the animals. Uh, so on the top, actually, we, we use a model which is a bit like an invasive pneumococcal disease or the bacteria. And so as you can see, actually, with our vaccine, actually, they do protect the, all the mice, has 100% of the mice protected. And on the other side, uh, the naive mice and the, some of the comparative uh, vaccine candidate my, uh, <coughs> things actually the majority of the mice actually are su succumb to the infection. And on the another way is uh, the pneumoc uh, the nasopharyngeal carrier or the colonization by the pneumococcus is also it's a very important uh, uh, indicator for the effectiveness of the vaccine. Uh, so we also looked at uh, actually in, <clears throat> in the mice after challenge and we kill them three or four days later on and their nasal has been washed and then the number of bacteria in the nasal has been covered. And so as you can see here is actually, num so this is actually the market, the PCV13 is a is a current vaccine uh, market called the Priven Prevenal. And uh, then the other is the other experiment vaccine. The bacteria number is not much bigger difference. And our, um, this uh, vaccine candidate actually does significantly reduce the number of uh, bacteria. And that's probably partial reason is because we give the vaccine uh, actually intranasally on the mucosal side, so they do induce better uh, mucosal immune uh, response. And so those, the, those type of thing actually is um, like a type three is including the in current pneumococcal vaccine. However, uh, we also uh, evaluated our vaccine in additional six vaccine strains and also two bacteria which actually the serotypes are not including the in current vaccine um, products. And the both show, show has a similar protective uh, uh, protective effect. Therefore, suggest actually this vaccine is not uh, uh, serotype uh, as, as you would expect, uh, not uh, limited, and uh, does induce uh, immune response to protect uh, multiple uh, clinical isolates and uh, multiple uh, serotypes. And uh, so, the, uh, so the other thing is actually, uh, it's the vaccine, <coughs> And also, as I show in here, they can prevent both the invasive disease and also reduce or eliminate the nasopharyngeal carriage of the, uh, of the bacteria. Because the reduced carriage actually is regarded very important for the public health point of view. So they will stop uh, the bacteria trans split between the um, population the carrier to the susceptible um, population. And the last piece of data, I hope the other one hasn't totally confused, is we try to um, figure out how does this vaccine work. And so here is, um, has a number of uh, names. So what is, uh, we basically uh, try to rem remove certain of the immune cells or the immune components from the vaccinated mice to see actually the, vac the mice now was lost their protection. So in this side, we basically done the number of, and the side 1.2 is a pan T cells. So they will remove all the T cells from mice. 
And the CD4, I think most of you probably familiar with, that is a subset of the T cells, which is very important. CD8 is the other sub subset of T cells and are important. And then we try to move both the CD4 and the CD8 T cell. And the antibody to the Azero GM1 will remove the pain NK cells. And so then we have to have a control and treatment and then thing. So as, similarly on the other side, we try to neutralize the IL-17 to see whether the TH-17 play a role. And we also removed the gamma delta T cells, which is another subset of minor T cells. And the interferon gamma type one uh, as a type one interferon actually also play a broad role in the host innate immune response, also primarily in the antiviral infection, but we also look at. So those sites basically put together, actually really only this group is lost the protection. And all the others, more or less, whether you have those cells or don't have those cells, and so only, only is the pan T cells actually uh, is obvious, is involved in uh, this protection. But of course, another thing we could not remove is the antibody induced. So those animals still have antibody. And, but because if we remove the T cells, actually they lost the protection, which implies actually the protective mechanism is not entirely relied on the antibodies. Otherwise, those mice should remain being protected. Yeah, so here is a, uh, it's, a, it's the same. Yeah, so basically, I think uh, I was uh, um, in the last few minutes, I basically tried to and convince you is actually lipidate some of the surface pneumococcal protein actually can make a vaccine which is self-adjuvant. In other words, you do not need additional adjuvants and which can um, as a potential of induce protective uh, immune re response against the uh, pneumococcal infection. And also the infection can cover different serotypes as far as we uh, test. Of, of course, we can't test all 94 serotypes because some of the bugs will not be able to infect the mice and all the uh, other reasons. And uh, <coughs> the vaccine does induce a very good antigen specific uh, mucosa in, immune response as well as a systematic immune response including TH1. TH17 response, and the vaccine protect against the uh, very aggressive lethal infection, and also reduce the bacterial carriage in the nasopharyngeal tract. And finally, actually, we find that is actually uh, the protective mechanism seems it is a T cell dependent, but not a dependent on CD4 or CD8 or gamma data. T cells. So uh, actually, what is the exact nature of the T cells? Uh, we are still under uh, investigation. And so this work, actually, as I mentioned, was in collaboration with a great team from the National Health Research Institute uh, in Taipei. And uh, uh, Dr. Ling is my counterpart. And we start from a collaboration. After years, now we become a good friends too. And uh, then, so his team contribute a lot. And uh, the right side, actually, uh, as people uh, in my lab, they did most of uh, the real work and uh, things. So uh, finally, I'd like to uh, thank you, Mercy. And uh, uh, I really appreciate that there is a much bigger Part of my exciting thing on the street, and but uh, you coming here to listen to my talk, and uh, so I'd be very happy to answer any question you may have.
Yes. I want to tell you if you study the uh, Mucosal Associated Environment Research. My main research. The, so, yeah, the mucosal associated invariant T cells. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, yes, uh, yeah, so the, the mucosal associated invariant T cells is uh, actually it's a, it's a type of T cells uh, in the mucosal system, and which was a recent year and to uh, find it, and they do play uh, important role in the host. Uh, uh, immune regulation, particularly like maintaining the host um, the, the homostatus and the microbiome and control side. And their role in most of the infection is not uh, like has been very well established or demonstrated. So study those cells has uh, some technique uh, and challenge because uh, most of those cells, there is no a very well unique defined phenotype. So if you like uh, try to remove them or something is much more uh, challenge. They're mu much more easier to analyze and them rather than, so it's not like a, you know, T cells, there is a very clear mark. You can take them out like a, um, TH17 cells, you can uh, remove all the effect molecules, the IL-17 things, yeah. What type of, uh, what type of, <laughs> yeah, what type of, uh, yeah, it's not working, probably. It's okay, it's okay, it's okay. Uh, lipids you are using. And so this, uh, this lip lipidation actually is not uh, where directly add the lipid into it. So this is actually what goes through the recombinant uh, antigen expression. So the NHI team has a platform basically in an E. coli system. They can put a, a sig signal uh, sequence into, yeah, in, the, in the front. So they have this platform taken. Is it N-terminal signal sequence? Uh, I believe it is, yeah. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Mm. Any other question? But you have a question. Thank you. Uh, is this universal vaccine is, 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 is alive or attenuated? Uh, this is a recombinant. But it's alive, yeah? No, it's not alive. It's not alive? Yeah, okay. so it's a, as a recombinant, it's a, like a People usually call it a subunit. Basically, it's a purified pro recombinant protein. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you used mice as, as a, for challenge experiment. Yeah, use the mice. Yeah. Why you select mice? Uh, actually, like uh, I think a number of reasons. Actually, I'm very good on this question because our animal care committee every time I put a protocol, we ask me. So number of things, I think uh, uh, we scientists being honest, number one, they are cheap. They are the cheapest one uh, to buy, but they have some other reasons. So the mouse system, actually, uh, the immune system is most well characterized. So we understand the system a lot. And uh, the other thing is there's lots of immunological reagents available uh, in them about the mice. If I'm going to use a ferret, for example, for flu, pardon? Rabbit is more close for uh, uh, rabbit. respiratory Yeah, problems. rabbits uh, actually, usually people use tradition for the toxicity, the safety study, but uh, not a lot for immu uh, immunological study. Rabbits are widely used for generating more polyclonal antibodies because you can get a lot of blood out. But otherwise, uh, actually, there is a very little uh, reagent. Like when I do the mechanistic study, I need a, a lot of specific antibody to lots of different uh, immune components. And so that actually at the moment, rats, there are some available. Monkey, actually, there are some available. And, uh, but uh, not much for the other animal species. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, when you said that you uh, saw increased populations of TH17 and TH1, yeah. it was in 
mucosal T cells in peripheral blood T cells or, or in a comparison of mucosal versus peripheral blood? Uh, yeah, so this increase actually because of the uh, technology to get enough cells. So those studies was done in the spring. Yeah, in the spring. So I have a question. That's a successful vaccine that you developed. Mm. To what it stands now? What's okay. the plan? Okay. So as I said, NRC, I think on this vaccine, I can only maybe take one more step forward is to a safety study. And then actually will be out of our mandate. And so we are try so what is now the best is try to convince uh, some of the company to take over. And so there is some, some leads the uh, company and discuss, but uh, the bigger pharmaceutical company will not be interested in this vaccine. And uh, one of the reasons is actually how to get this vaccine to be approved, get into the clinical trial or license is a, a big challenge. And because if you, now if you say from 23 uh, variant vaccine, you want to make 48, actually the regulatory pathway is very clear. You induce immune response to those variant you are adding, and you do the optionization assay to show actually your serum can increase the macrophage kill the bacteria and then you show it's safe in the human. That's virtually, yes, because of the regulatory pathway for the uh, conjugate vaccine, particularly for pneumococcus. And where this one is, because it's not zero specific, so some of those assays will not be applied. And more importantly, also I show you very convinced the mice uh, is surviving the very well. I think like this gentleman reason why you the mice, not uh, the human, because the mice protect me can be meaning nothing in the human. Absolutely possible. And so therefore, how to bridge this is a thing. And so last year in Melbourne, actually, I was uh, involved in an expert panel discussion uh, about uh, uh, this. So the one possibility is actually maybe is for company to taking a combination approach. Use a conjugate vaccine, but a significantly less variant. Uh, so not uh, expanding the variant. And then with a protein vaccine as a combination, then just like this morning we did, so they only need to demonstrate the safety and the less inferiority. So as long as add the new protein vaccine does not uh, make the conjugate vaccine worse, and that will be able to push slow the uh, way. But on the other side, they re significantly reduce the cost because they don't have to make it more and more variant. So at the moment, there is a company actually are looking at this, and they want to license both the conjugate vaccine from somewhere else, and then maybe license our, and our technology. Great. No, no last call. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, thank you. you. And, uh, thank you. Everyone.